the deepest parts of our heart that our true satisfaction and joy come when you are our everything. God, today, if there are things that are competing for our heart's allegiance, I pray that those things would be cast down, kicked out of the throne room of our life, that you would be seated firmly in place. God, I pray today that you would meet with us, that you would speak to our hearts, God. That you would reveal to us your character and our relationship with you, our dependence mm -hmm. upon you. Yes, Lord. We love you. We ask these things in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, good morning again. Today we are kicking off a brand new series, and it's actually the theme series of this year. Because our theme comes from Psalms 46.10, which is to be still and to know that he is God. And here's what I've learned over the course of my Christian life is that life is crazy and hectic. And things often come at you at a million miles an hour. And sometimes things come at you and you're completely shocked. You weren't expecting it. <clears throat> and it's very important that we learn the truth of this verse. To be still and to know that he is God. To acknowledge, to recognize just who our Savior is and what He's done for us. Yes. It will make a massive difference in your life. And so I'd like for us to, as we kick off this series, read uh, the 11 verses from Psalms 46, but then we're going to circle back and really we're, we're going to just focus on verse 1 today. And we're going to walk through each verse throughout this series. And again, my goal for you is that you would really discover the importance of being still and of knowing just who your Redeemer is. It's going to really make a massive difference in your life. Just imagine. Think to yourself. How do people go through life and encounter life and all the ups and downs of life without God? And I don't want you to live your life like that. I want you to learn this very important principle of being still in the presence of God. Recognizing and acknowledging who he is as it relates to you and what a difference that can make in your life. So Psalms 46, and I put it up here on the screens. It's also in your note sheet. I hope you'll pull that out and you'll jot some things down. It will help with uh, your uh, memory of the things we're going to be talking about and covering today. So Psalms 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Selah. You see that in your Bible there? Selah. That means pause. Not only musically, because remember the psalms were songs, but they were pausing for a purpose so that you could reflect on what's just been sung or what's just been read. Look at it again. Just verses 1, 2, and 3 for a second. Verse 4. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Selah. Look at it. Think about it. Reflect on it. Verse 8. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I'll be honored by every nation. I'll be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's army is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Say love. Think about it. Reflect upon that truth. Now, 
What you would discover if you were reading through the Psalms is that Psalms 46 is a response to the expressed frustrations of Psalms 42, 43, and 44. So I want you to just hold your place here in Psalms 46 and just kind of glance back at Psalms 42, 43, and 44. They're going through some difficulties. There's some storms raging in their life. And they're expressing frustration and anxiety and stress and worry and apprehension. That was the season they were going through. That may be the season that you're going through. That may be the chapter that's open right now in your life. Frustration. But it doesn't come to stay, right? As it says in Genesis, and it came to pass. It's going to pass. It's not going to stay. Storms don't last forever. Psalms 46 is coming. So I want you to think about that. Has there ever been a time of great frustration in your life? Anxiety. You ever felt powerless? Mm-hmm. Anybody just nod your heads like this? Mm-hmm. You can relate to that. Okay. So this is how they were feeling at the time of Psalms 46's writing to Syria. Really, that's modern day Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey area. Yeah. Modern day uh, Assyria. They were very powerful and they were very cruel. Up to this point, they had already destroyed, ransacked 46 Israeli cities, and they had deported over 200,000 Jews. Imagine living through that nightmare. How you would feel the frustration that would be just a part of your life every single day. Not only had Assyria done this to the Hebrews, but they were also forcing them... To pay an annual financial tribute. So I want you to know that when King Hezekiah finally assumed the throne in Judah, he bows up. And he doesn't want to pay that tribute anymore. And I think that maybe part of what he was thinking was. Assyria has conquered so many nations, maybe they'll forget about us. But it really put the people in a bind to have to pay that tribute. You guys know the story of Robin Hood, right? Yes. And they would come and they would take and they would take and they would take and the people would be put in jeopardy. Same kind of situation here. So it really wasn't something that you looked forward to to doing. You were forced to do it or like they would kill you. So he says, I don't want to do that anymore. Well, Sennacherib, that is really the king of Assyria at this time, he retaliates and he tells them, I'm going to besiege not just any city, but the holy city of Jerusalem. I want you to hold your place here in Psalms 46, and I want you to flip back with me to 2 Kings chapter 18, because chronologically, this is the context. For the writing of Psalms 46. And so I want you to kind of be able to follow along with me and, and, and catch the story. 2 Kings chapter 18. I want you to notice the threat of Assyria's king here. Verse 19, it says, Then the Assyrian king's chief of staff told them to give this message to Hezekiah. This is what the great king of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you counting on? That you have rebelled against me on Egypt? If you can lean on Egypt, it will be like a reed that splinters beneath your weight and pierces your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is completely unreliable. So this is what the king of Assyria is telling Hezekiah. And what he was saying was right. At this particular time, Egypt was completely unreliable. They were not someone that you could count on to have your back. Verse 22, he keeps going, but perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? 
This is some half truth right here. It is true. Hezekiah tore down some of the shrines. But they were shrines that weren't honoring God. And it really didn't insult God that he did this. But this was a serious king's twist on it. Verse 23, he keeps going. He's trying to get into their minds. Trying to make them afraid. Trying to get them to lose faith in God. He says, I tell you what, strike a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can find that many men to ride on them. You notice the exclamation mark? There, it's, it's intensity that he's saying these things. It's, it's a jest. He, he's just kind of making fun of them, being sarcastic. 24, with your tiny army, how can you think of challenging even the weakest contingent of my master's troops, even with the help of Egypt's chariots and charioteers? What's more, do you think we have invaded your land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us, attack this land and destroy it. Now, this is highly suspect. Now, I will say this. There are times that God allows other nations to discipline his people. I don't think this is one of them. But, again, you're trying to get into the hearts and minds of people and cause them to, to be afraid. And so you're going to say whatever you can say. To get them to even doubt God. God's the one that told us to do this. So he says. Verse 26. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, Shebner, and Joah said to the Assyrian chief of staff, Please speak to us in Aramaic, for we understand it well. Don't speak in Hebrew, for the people on the wall will hear. So understand the situation here. These representatives of King Hezekiah are talking to the representatives of king of Syria. And they're saying, can you guys just, can you speak in Assyrian? Because these things that you're saying, these threats that you're making, I mean, they're kind of getting us rattled. And we really would like to just kind of keep it, you know, uh, kind of closed in to just us. They're saying, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to speak in the language that everybody can hear, the people on the wall, people in the city, because we want them to, to be afraid as well. <laughs> okay, keep in mind. Then verse 27, but Sennacherib's chief of staff replied, Do you think my master sent this message only to you and your master? He wants all the people to hear it. For when we put this city under siege, they will suffer lo along with you. They will be so hungry and thirsty, they will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. Okay. Hello. Absolutely. Okay. Tell me that's not going to mess with your mind. Oh, yes. This is their, their goal, their point. Verse 28, then the chief of staff stood and shouted in Hebrew to the people on the wall, listen to this message from the great king of Assyria. This is what the king says, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will never be able to rescue you from my power. Don't let him fool you into trusting in the Lord by saying the Lord will surely rescue us. This city will never fall into the hands of the Assyrian king. Don't listen to Hezekiah. These are the terms the king of Assyria is offering. Make peace with me. Open the gates and come out. Then each of you can continue eating from your own grapevine, which sounds a lot better than the other alternative, right? Yes. Yes. And fig tree and drinking from your own well. Then I will arrange to take you to another land like this one, a land of grain and new wine, bread and vineyards, olive groves and honey. Choose life instead of death. The land that they were living was what land? The promised land. Who promised them that land? God. It was a covenant promise. I will give you this land to you and to your ancestors. God rescued them from Pharaoh, took them through all of that, put them in the promised land, and now the king of Assyria is saying, we're going to take you out of that land. Now, how do you think when the people heard all these threats were feeling, and then when they hear his offer... What do you think the majority of them wanted to do? They probably wanted to take it, right? Because yeah. that's fear leading. That's fear talking. They're trying to put a wedge between their king and themselves. Don't trust Hezekiah. Don't trust God. Choose life instead of death. And see, this is what the enemy always does. I hope you'll just understand this. This is what the enemy always does. He promises one thing. 
But he doesn't make good on his promises. When does he do that? After you've accepted his offer. Right? The devil's not going to come at you with horns and a pitchfork. Why well, the devil? I want to destroy you. He's too smart for that. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said, he is uh, tricky. He is a schemer. He's an angel of light. He can even make himself look good and right. And so Paul says we're not to be ignorant of his schemes. See, this is the devil in disguise here. I'll make it easy on you. Just come to another land. Yeah, right. But that did not stop him from going, let's get out of here. I don't want to look forward to what I'm supposed to be eating in the future or drinking. Let's get out of here. Certainly he's right and God's wrong. Certainly he's right and Hezekiah is wrong. Keep reading with me. Don't listen to Hezekiah when he tries to mislead you by saying the Lord will rescue us. Listen to how they continue. Have the gods of any other nation ever saved their people from the king of Assyria? And gods is lowercase g. Do you see that? What happened to the gods of Hamath and Arpad? What about the gods of Seravaim and Hena and Iva? Did any god rescue Samaria from my power? You see, you know what the answer to that was? No. He was speaking truth here. None of those other gods did anything for their people. And so he's assuming that the God of the Hebrews is like all the other gods. And he's also wanting the people to doubt in their God. You ever thought to yourself, maybe there are many ways to God. Maybe everybody, maybe God is just, you know, um, there's one God, but he, he appears differently to different people. You ever heard those kind of lies? Yeah. Yeah, th this is the devil. This is how he works. He wants to deceive you. He wants to make you think that there's no difference between the God you serve and the God the gods other people serve. Verse 35. What God of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? But the people were silent and did not utter a word because Hezekiah commanded them, do not answer him. So I'm so glad they did it. Verse 37. Then Elohim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joah, son of Asa. The royal historian went back to Hezekiah. They tore their clothes in despair. And they went in to see the king and told him what the Assyrian king, or chief of staff had said. So get the picture here. They, they hear all of these threats. The people on the wall heard all these threats. And they're, they're freaked out. They're worried. They're scared. Part of that is just being human. I get it. They're tearing their clothes, which is an outward sign of inner, inner grief. Inner fear, inner turmoil. In chapter 9, I love, chapter 19 rather, I love this because Hezekiah goes directly to God. He acknowledges God's sovereignty and Judah's total dependence on him. He acknowledges that he and the nation need God. And here's the wonderful thing just as God showed up when Egypt was an issue, God shows up when Assyria is an issue and God handled some business. Because in chapter 19, when Assyria is preparing themselves to besiege Jerusalem, God sends an angel to the camp. And that night, things get completely wrecked. 185,000 Assyrians die. And so the next morning, when a Sennacherib wakes up and discovers the devastation, he turns tail and he runs without ever having... Uh, shot an arrow at Jerusalem, which is what God said would happen. So one moment, put yourself in their shoes. On one day, things look completely bleak, but then just like the threat is gone. And as you might imagine, Hezekiah and the nation, how do you think they felt about this change of events? 
They're sad, very happy. And I want you to know that it's in that elation, it's in that elation that most scholars believe Hezekiah wrote Psalms 46, 47, and 48. And so for the next six weeks, we're going to continue to study Psalms 46. But I wanted you to know the backstory of this psalm. Because really, this is a celebratory psalm. In the moment of their crisis, God stepped in and took care of them. And so they're praising God for the reality of who he is in their time of need. And who he is just in relationship to them. And how different and how unique the one true God is. And that's one of the things that Hezekiah prays when he prays because he says, God sent a cherub is saying like we're gonna that that you're just like all the other gods. But that's not true because those gods, little G, are made by human hands. But you are the God who made everything. Amen. So God takes care of them. So we're studying verse one, but Again, please keep the backstory at the forefront as we read this. Go back and look at verse 1 again. They cry out to God. They sing to God with all their hearts. God is our refuge and strength. Always ready to help in times of trouble. And I just love how this is stated matter-of-factly. God is our refuge and strength. Amen. Yes, it's not like... Uh, Maybe God's our refuge. No, it's direct. God is our refuge and our strength. And I wonder if that's true for you. I mean, it's easy to say he is, but is he really? Is that who you run to when things get tight and scary? Are you looking to yourself and try to do it yourself and fix it yourself? Or do you look to other people? Or do you look to money? Or do you look to your job or whatever? What are you looking to? Is God truly your refuge and strength? I want you to write down this definition. Refuge is defined as a place of shelter and protection. A place of shelter and protection. And it's so amazing because there's so many stories that have kind of been created and, and happened as a result of Psalms 46. Young Scottish men, as they were boarding the ship and leaving to go out to fight in World War I, family and friends in the community would gather around them before they leave. They put their hands on their shoulders, they prayed for them, and they would sing Psalms 46. That God would be a place of shelter and protection for them as they go off to face their foes. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. Psalms 46 was a huge inspiration to him, which led to him breaking away from the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Believe me, you have to believe God is a place of shelter and protection if you're going to break away from the Catholic Church, because there will be retaliation. And there was for Martin Luther. He went through it because he came out and he placed those 95 things there. That he's saying, this is, this is not necessarily true in the way that you are teaching it. I've discovered God's word and it, and it contradicts. There's going to be you know, uh, issues. But he believed God was his refuge and strength and he wrote that great hymn of our faith. Uh, um, oh, goodness. Uh, Mighty refuge is our God or something like that. Mighty fortress is our God. That's right. Thank you. He believed God is his refuge. You know, every single day, people place confidence in something. In other words, people... Take refuge in something. What do you take refuge in? God. Now, some people look to substances. Some people look to sex. Mm -hmm. Some people look to TV. Mm -hmm. Medicine. God is your true source of refuge. Amen. Hope you believe that. Hope you live like that. Pilots put confidence in their planes. 
Commuters place confidence in trains, cars, and buses. What are you putting your confidence in? What's your refuge? Who's your shelter? You know, time and time again, King David sought God in refuge. He wanted God to be his place of strength, his place of safety. And if you know the story, King Saul, who was the king, ventured off, started doing his own thing, was not listening to God's prophet. So God told Samuel, I've got another king. And remember, he sends him to the house of Jesse, and he goes through all of his sons, and he picks David, right? God says, he's the one, anoint him to be the next king. Well, it would be some years before he would assume the throne. So as many kings were, they were very territorial. So on more than five different occasions over a period of ten years, Saul is trying to kill David. Because he's like, you know, that God picked him to be the next king, but I don't want him to be the next king because I'm the king. So David seeks refuge in caves and in mountainous areas. Time and time again, if you just read the Psalms, the ones that David authored, he just expounds this truth. God is my refuge. He is my place of shelter, my place of protection. So David put his confidence in God. He recognized, just as Hezekiah, God is the true place of security. Only true security comes from God. If you think about it, the things that God has promised you are things that people can't take away from you. Yeah. Right? Amen. They can't take away your salvation. They cannot take away heaven from you. They can't take away so many things that God says, I will give you. So many times we pour our energy and, and focus on things that can be taken away yeah. rather than what can't be taken away. God can't be taken away from us. He's our refuge and strength. I'm reminded of Deuteronomy chapter 33. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but all that the people of Israel had went through and they were right on the precipice of going into the promised land. God Tells Moses you need to find 12 guys and you go spy out the land. Y'all with me on the story? Mm -hmm. Before they go in Deuteronomy chapter 33, Moses says this to God's people, which should have encouraged them, which should have given them faith, which should have reminded them of who they were and who their God was and what their God had done for them. But he says this in verse 27, the eternal God is your refuge. And his everlasting arms are under you. He drives out the enemy before you. He cries out, destroy them. The everlasting God. His eternal arms, they're under you. You see, we have a refuge that's eternal. That's everlasting. Meaning it can never end. It's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and always. He's our refuge. His arms are under us. Again, should have encouraged them. And yet, 10 of the 12 come back and say, we can't do it. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're giants. And so they want to, again, tuck tail and run. Yeah. Go back to Egypt. This is crazy. You see, they weren't in that moment looking to God as their refuge. We do the same thing. Sometimes, again, we look to temporary refuge, refuge places. Or maybe they're not refuge places at all. We think they are. But what we need to do is to turn to God. He's the only one who can hold us up Amen. when things are spinning out of Amen. control. Amen. I'm reminded of another story of a person who came to understand that God is the true source of refuge. And strength. Y'all remember the story of Ruth? Mm -hmm. yeah. I love it. It's one of my, the book of Ruth, honestly, is probably one of my most favorite books in the entire Bible because Ruth was this Moabite. And some Hebrews during a famine had left and moved into the land of Moab. And this guy has two sons and they marry these Moabite women, and Ruth is one of them. If you know the story, 
And I don't think it was at the same time, but over a period of years, the father and both sons died, which left three widows. And it was so hard for Naomi, that's the mom, that she decided, I've got to go back home. Because I've got family there. They can help me. I'm a widow now. And again, I've told you this many times. It was rough on widows. Especially if your sons were dead. Mm-hmm. So one of the daughter-in-laws, Orpah, Naomi says, you can, you're can. you young. You can remarry. You can stay here. And she told Ruth the same thing. But Ruth said, no way. I'm going to go with you. Yeah. And she works hard. And she takes care of Naomi. God in his providence and his love. He brings Ruth and Boaz together. Yeah. Boaz was one of Naomi's kinsmen redeemers. Someone in her family that were to help look after her. And Boaz takes notice of Ruth and how hardworking she is and how loving she is to Naomi and the sacrifice that she's made to leave her land and go to a new land. And now she would be the foreigner. And Boaz says something so beautiful in Ruth chapter 2 verse 12. You don't have to turn there, but this is, this is what he says to her. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. <laughs> And so you see, she took refuge in the one true God. And we know that she became a follower of the true God. Mm -hmm. God became her refuge. And if you know the lineage of Jesus, this is what's so beautiful, um, is that she's grafted into the lineage of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. (laughs) She... Takes refuge. And so, you know, it just goes to show you that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what you've done. Maybe even in Ruth's case, you worshiped another God. When you come to know the true God, He has a plan for you. Amen. He grabs Amen. you in, He loves you. Amen. Amen. And He wants to be your refuge and your strength. Yeah. So I ask you, like Ruth, like David, like Hezekiah, is God your refuge? Yes, he is. I mean, really, is God your refuge? When things are hard, do you pray to him? Yeah. Yeah. Do you seek godly counsel from other Christians? Do you turn to the word of God? Yeah. Do you lean deeply into his church? Are you turning to God? Is he your refuge? Verse 1 again, God is our refuge and strength. And then this next part I want you to notice. Read it with me. God is our refuge and strength. Always ready. Wow. Always ready. Circle that. I mean, that's a beautiful thought, right? Amen. God is always ready. Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Sunday school, we were reading about how God is gracious and he is just always ready again. To show graciousness and compassion if you've gotten off track, if you turn to him and you confess your sins, he's always ready to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is the character of our God. He wants to be your refuge. So are you really turning to him? Because he's always ready to help. Notice that. Always ready to help. Thank you. So God is faithful. He's always ready. And he's always ready when? Always. 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 He's ready to do what? Help. To help when? In times of trouble. In times of trouble. You see, God is a faithful God. God is faithful to his covenant promises. That's one of the reasons that he stepped in and took care of his nation, Judah and Hezekiah. Because, again, one of his covenant promises that God had made is that this land would always be his people's. Right? Amen. And send a chair to say, I'm going to take you out and move you somewhere else. God said, I'm faithful to my covenant. I promised them this land. Amen. Yes, he did. Got your back. See, he's faithful. God is faithful even when we are not. Amen. Just think about that. He surrounds us far better than the wall of China. Yes. 
And listen, the wall of China can be seen from space. Mm. Think about that. Our God is great and big and amazing, and he's got our back. He's our refuge and strength. Now, i got one more scripture I want to read you. And I've actually put this one up on the screen. So I would like you to turn to Hebrews 6. This is a very uh, comparative and supportive passage of scripture. In the New Testament, upon, uh, upon this principle that God, as a matter of fact, is our refuge and strength. Hebrews chapter 6. And I want you to look at verse 16 with me. Notice what God's word says. Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. Right? Yeah. So in a court of law, they put their hand on what? God. Right. And they're pledging to who? God. That they're going to tell the truth, right? That they're going to keep their oath. Yeah. This is the oath they're taking. Without any question, that oath is binding, right? Is it, a, is it a crime to put your hands on a Bible and then to lie? Yeah. Absolutely. It's binding. Yeah. Verse 17. Yeah. God also bound himself with an oath. Just let that sink into your mind. Completely unnecessary. Right. And that's my opinion, okay? God did it, but it's, I mean, God didn't have to double down. No. Because he's trustworthy. Yeah. But he takes an oath. So that those who received this promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Mm -hmm. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about the fact that he is your heavenly father and that he has a purpose and plan for you to guide you and to lead you. Thank you, Lord. Verse 18. So God has given both his promise and his oath. Yeah. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Yeah. Therefore, we who have fled to him for, what's the word? Refuge. refuge. If you fled to Jesus for refuge, say amen. 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 I was weak. Come on. Say amen. amen. All right. Keep reading with me. If you fled to Jesus for refuge, you can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Yeah. It leads us to the curtain in God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Jehovah. Yeah. Now this is a very encouraging passage because it says that if you fled to Jesus for refuge, then you have received two unchangeable things. Amen. Thank you. First of all, you've received God's oath and you've received God's promise. Mm -hmm. And if that's not enough for you, listen, there are some pictures here that the author of Hebrews paints for us to kind of explain it to us and show us what our refuge is like. Yeah. And I want you to see this because first of all, he says our refuge that we've received and we possess is like an anchor. Y'all know what anchors are, right? Yeah. You drop them down when you're in deep waters and what does the anchor do? Oh, it holds you down to that water. It holds you firm and secure. And this is like the refuge that we have in God. Oh, thank he you. is like our anchor. He holds us. Amen. He's got us. I love that. Amen. He also says that our refuge is like a city that we fled to. He says, those who have fled to him for refuge. Now, you might just overlook this if you just read it. And you don't realize what's in the mind of the writer and the Holy Spirit. You see, in the Old Testament, they would have cities of refuge. Sanctuary cities that they would flee to yeah. for safety, for protection. And this is a reference that he's making here. It's like a person who's fled to one of those cities. We fled to Jesus. Okay. Our refuge is like one of these cities. Amen. Let me just read you a little bit about what Numbers 35 says about these cities. And God's talking to Moses. It says, the Lord said to Moses, give the following instruction to the people of Israel. When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, designate cities of refuge to which people can flee if they have killed someone accidentally. These cities will be places of protection from a dead person's relatives who want to avenge the death. The slayer must not be put to death before being tried by the community. So there's this picture here, not only of an anchor, but this picture of one of these cities of refuge that we have fled to Jesus. And there's safety there. Romans 8 tells us there's now no more condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So it's like an anchor. It's like a refuge. 
And then this other thing that's kind of pictured here is our refuge is like a scout. Now, scouts were sent out to make for sure that where they all were going to be going was safe. Yes. And when it was safe, they would give the all clear. Right? Yes. It's safe for you to come in here. And Hebrews 6.20 says, Jesus has already gone in there for us. Yes. So Jesus, this refuge that he provides, it's like a scout because, again, the picture here is the holy of holies. If you guys know how this goes in the Old Testament, but even when the priest would go in there, he would have a chain to his leg because there's a very good chance that he might get struck down dead. They go in there, they don't want to get struck down, so they would drag him out. Make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not safe to go in there if you're not supposed to be in there. Mm -hmm. okay. But what happened when Jesus was being crucified? The veil that separated was torn from the top to the bottom. See, Jesus has went in there. He's given out the all clear. If you know my, my, if you know my Father, if you have this relationship with me, the all clear has been sounded. Amen. I love that. Thank you. Amen. This refuge we have in Jesus Christ, yeah. in God, it's like an anchor. It's like a city. It's like a scout. Verse one again. God is our refuge and strength, yeah. always ready to help all in times of trouble. Is God your refuge this morning? Yeah. Are you looking to something else? It's very possible for you to be a follower of Christ and to be looking to other things. Yeah. It's not right, but it's possible. Yeah. God's your only source. Look to Him. Pray to Him. Turn to His Word. Seek godly counsel. Lean deeply into His church. If he really is your refuge and your strength. Would you bow your heads with me? God, it's so easy. It's so easy to say one thing and to do another. God, I just pray that, that we wouldn't be like that. Lord, we all do it. We all respond quickly. Yes, God's our refuge. He's our strength. And then things get scary and we feel powerless and we're frustrated. We start trying to fix it all ourselves. As if everything depended on us. As if we are our own refuge and strength. We go to other people. We put all of this pressure on them. And it's not supposed to be like that because they can't be God for us. There's only one source of safety and protection. And it's you, God. You are perfect at it. So many times, God, again, we, we run to one empty well after the other. Pray, God, that we wouldn't respond to all of the threats of the enemy. As I think back to Hezekiah and the people and Sennacherib, and he was trying to get into their hearts and their minds and make them afraid and to seek refuge and lesser things. Well, that's what the enemy does to us. That's the lies that we hear and we believe. And I pray, God, that just as the people did, we wouldn't cave into those fears. That we wouldn't even respond to those lies. That we would let them go in one ear and out the other. And that we would hold firmly to your promises. To who you are. Because you, God, are our refuge and strength. Heads bowed and eyes closed. How many say, Pastor Corey? Going through a storm right now. I'm frustrated. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's my finances. Maybe I'm having issues with one of my children. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a job problem. Whatever it is. 
you're going through it right now and you would just raise your hand and you would say, pray for me, Pastor Corey. I see those hands all over the building. I need God's help. I acknowledge He's my refuge and strength, but so often I'm tempted to turn to other sources to try to fix it myself. So just pray for me. Is there anybody like that here today to say, I'm going through it, but I, I really, really want to lean into God. I don't want to just say He's my refuge. I want to act like He's my refuge. Anybody else? And I see those hands. God. You've given victories in our lives as well. Past victories we can look back at and see where you brought us through. Help us not to forget. Help us to have faith. Help us to turn to you. To seek you first. God, I pray that people would feel your presence. Whatever they're going through, that you would give them direction. That you'd help them to know that you have them safe in your arms, your everlasting arms. May they feel your refuge. We are safe in your hands. God, thank you for giving victory to your people back then. And I thank you for giving victory to your people even still today. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Just work in hearts, God. Lord, I pray that you would take the words of this series from, my, from Psalm 46 and you would grow us. And you would help us to deepen our faith in you. That our confidence would grow who you are and who we are to you. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.